Continuing to read from my book, The Empathy Gap, Chapter 7, Section 7.11. Summary. The Empathy Gap in Work, Pay, Wealth, Spending and Taxes. The empathy gap in the context of work and pay is manifest in the perception that women work more but are paid less, together with men's greater earnings being presented as a key aspect of patriarchal power. This has the perverse effect of portraying men's positive contribution to family life and society generally as oppression. The evidence is that the situation is rather more nuanced and considerably less one-sided. Since 1971, women's economic inactivity has reduced from 45% to an all-time low of 26%. In contrast, men's economic inactivity has increased from 5% to 17%. The dominant reasons for the increase in men's economic inactivity are full-time education and long-term sickness. A further contribution is the increase in the number of men in a full-time homekeeping role, now about a quarter of a million in the UK. For women, this is just under two million. The unemployment rate is currently the same for men and women, and is at a four-decade low. Prior to 2018, men's unemployment rate had been greater than women's for 37 years. Recessions affect men's employment more than women's. Employment is gender polarised. Most occupations have significantly different numbers of male and female employees. Of 331 employment areas, just 73 occupations, 22%, have employee numbers within plus or minus 30% of equality. 151, 46%, have an excess of male employees over female employees exceeding 30%. 107, 32%, have an excess of female employees over male employees exceeding 30%. Across all areas, women are 46% of those employed, men 54%. But in the public sector, women comprise about two-thirds of employees, twice as many as men. The education sector is roughly 78% female. NHS employees are roughly 75% women. At present, there are pressures to increase diversity within companies. This is interpreted to mean reproducing the nation's demographic distribution within each company. It's beyond the scope of this book to critique this initiative. However, the extent of polarisation in employment at present indicates the scale of the redistribution of workers which would be required to achieve such an objective. The requirement to reproduce the macro demographics within not just every company, but at every level of seniority within each company, represents a massively overconstrained problem. So far, the drive for increasing diversity has been confined to areas where women or minorities are underrepresented, and also in occupations which might be deemed desirable. There is less appetite for rebalancing in areas where men are underrepresented, as we saw in the case of education, see sections 2.6 and 2.7. Nor is the idea so popular in those occupations which currently result in the majority of fatal workplace accidents or fatal occupational illnesses, which society and feminists are content to remain a male preserve. See section 3.4. The median gender pay gap for full-time employees across the whole UK was 9.1% in favour of men in 2017. However, the full-time pay gap is negligible below the age of 40.
The pay gap varies significantly across the four nations of the UK. In Northern Ireland, the median full-time pay gap is in favour of women, minus 3.4%. The part-time median pay gap UK-wide is also in favour of women, minus 5.1%. Legislation to force UK companies with more than 250 employees to report their gender pay gap data resulted in 10,522 companies submitting data for 2017-18 by the 18th of June 2018. Of the 10,522 companies, 1,932 reported pay gaps in favour of women on either a mean or a median basis. Women's employment is strongly skewed towards part-time working, with 42% of employed women working part-time compared to only 13% of employed men. The 2012 British Social Attitude Survey revealed that 69% of people believed that fathers should be the primary earner for the family, and 73% believed that fathers should work full-time. No respondents to Within Rounding thought the mother should be the primary earner, and only 9% thought that mum and dad should share the earning responsibility equally. Based on this survey, those people who advocate for increasing women's working hours and getting more women working full-time and more men working part-time in favour of childcare do not reflect the majority opinion of women themselves or men's opinion. The British Social Attitude Survey appears to suggest that women's preference for part-time working reflects their unconstrained wishes, as does men's preference for full-time working. Over the UK as a whole, men work 52% more paid hours than women and earn about 91% more. But women now spend more money, or influence the spending of more money than men. So there's a net flow of money from men to women for the purposes of spending. Men pay 73% of the income tax into the Exchequer. This funds the public sector, two-thirds of whose employees are women. The public sector enjoys far more lucrative pension provisions than the private sector, similar provisions having almost disappeared from the private sector due to unsustainable costs. The previous explicitly sexist state pension rules have now been equalised, but not without cries of inequality from adherents of the equality is inequality school of thought. Women do have smaller pensions on retirement than men due to lesser contributions, despite provision for national insurance credits associated with child benefit and similar arrangements for other benefits. However, the gap is reducing, and women receive a pension for longer, on average, than men. There are a million more women than men in receipt of a state pension, and it used to be far more. Over the last 40 to 50 years, the time spent by women on housework has reduced substantially, whilst the time men spend on housework has increased substantially. Nevertheless, men still do less unpaid housework than women, though the bulk of the difference can be attributed to who is more likely to be working part-time or not at all. Combining paid working hours and unpaid household work, men and women work either about the same number of hours on average or men work rather more. Men and women do about the same amount of unpaid voluntary work. Contrary to popular belief, men carry out a substantial proportion of unpaid caring, 42%, and a larger proportion of men than women are unpaid carers in the over 65 age range. Substantially more men than women do 50 or more hours of unpaid care weekly 
as well as working full time. All these observations together imply that men's substantially larger number of paid working hours and hence greater earnings represent a positive contribution that men make to family life and society generally. Men's longer paid working hours lead to men's far larger payments into the exchequer in tax, which funds the welfare state and the public sector, from which women benefit far more than men. In short, the economy is gendered, in the sense that money flows from men to women. The presentation of this as this male contribution as patriarchal dominance is a calumny. The acceptance by the public of the feminist narrative on the pay gap to the neglect of all the other factors addressed in this chapter is another aspect of the empathy gap.